Welcome to the annual Women's Leadership Breakfast. I'm Sister Jean Steffes, General Superior of the Congregation of the Sisters of St. Agnes, and it is our privilege as Sisters of St. Agnes to host this gathering. It's good to see all of you. How I wish it were in person. Even so, it is a delight to share this morning with you. We gather to celebrate the gift of leadership in ourselves and in those who have mentored us in what it means to initiate and to take responsibility professionally and personally. There is no aspect of our lives that is not touched by the need for some part of leadership. Leadership is hard to define. Maybe, may, may we be the ones to define it with a blend of integrity and compassion. Leadership can be like a handful of water. May be, we be the people to share it with those who thirst for justice, peace, and equality. Leadership is not about watching and correcting. Help us to remember it is about listening and connecting. Finally, leadership is not about telling people what to do. As leaders, let us first find out what people want. This is our gift. This is our challenge. And so now let us take a moment for prayer. Give us, O oh God, leaders whose hearts are large enough to match the breadth of our own souls and give us souls strong enough to follow leaders of vision and wisdom. Give us leaders who lead us to virtue without seeking to impose our kind of virtue on the virtue of others. We trust you, great God, to give the vision as a people to know where leadership truly lies, to pursue it diligently, to require it to protect human rights for everyone, everywhere. Bless this gathering. Bless all of us and our loved ones. Keep us safe as we reach out to keep others safe as well. We ask these things, great God, with minds open to your word and hearts that trust in your eternal care. And together we say, amen. And so now um, I turn this over to Dusty Krakow. So Dusty. Thank you, Sister Jean. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dusty Krakow, and I serve as the Director of Mission Advancement for the congregation, and I will serve as your MC for this morning's event. As Sister Jean indicated, we are gathered here today to celebrate the gift of leadership. The timing of this annual event is designed to coincide with two significant events, Mother Agnes Day, which occurs on March 6th, and Catholic Sisters Week, which runs from March 8th through the 14th. Mother Agnes has it embodied courageous initiative as the first general superior of the Sisters of St. Agnes. She represented the congregation as a strong leader in the city of Fond du Lac and the surrounding area. Her passion for education and healthcare, coupled with her strong collaborative relationships with others in the city, ensured a strong foundation for the Sisters of St. Agnes, many of whom continue to minister in both Fond du Lac and throughout the world. And we're joined today by numerous sisters of St. Agnes and their associates. And while Zoom does not allow us to have them stand to be recognized, I would like to take a moment to say thank you to all of them for their continued service to the community and to the world. For our event this year, CSA welcomes six panelists representing local healthcare, education, and community services who will share how they responded to the needs of local women during the pandemic. Our healthcare panelists will be Catherine Virgos, the president of St. Agnes Hospital, and Don Vandenberg, the regional director of mission integration of SSM Health. The education panel will showcase Chris Wittoon, a December 2020 graduate who utilized Marion University's Working Families Grant Program and the program's director, Carrie Strupp. Finally, the Community Services Panel will feature Amy Bayer, Prevention Educator for Domestic Violence Services, and Teresa Menting, Executive Director of the Gable Family Foundation Women's Empowerment Series. Each pair of women identified different opportunities to meet the needs of those they serve 
and then responded to those needs with courageous initiative. After they share their presentations, you'll be invited to ask questions and learn more about how you too can have an individual impact on global problems. At this time, we'll be randomly assigning each one of you to one of three breakout rooms. Each pair of panelists will offer a 10 to 15 minute presentation on our day's focus and then respond to questions from you, the audience. When a total of 20 minutes have passed, the panelists will be rotated to a new room with a new audience to repeat the process. When they've been in every breakout room, the breakout rooms will automatically close and everyone will be returned to the main room. If for some reason you see a pop-up button in front, appear in front of you uh, with the option to join a breakout room, uh, you please hit the join button. Uh, but otherwise, you should be moved directly into your breakout room. And we hope the smaller space will allow you to have uh, a greater willingness to participate in conversation following the panelists' uh, presentations. And with that, I'll be giving you all permission to uh, unmute yourselves when you're in the breakout room, should you need to do so, but please remain muted unless you're called upon to ask your questions. And now you'll be heading into your breakout rooms. Enjoy. And let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Sister Alice Ann and I'll be serving as the facilitator for your community service panelists. If you have questions for the panelists, please type them in the chat and I will be sure that we address them as many as possible during the five minute Q&A period at the end of the session. You can uh, type those questions in anytime during the presentation. Just anytime you hear something, you have a question, type it in. We'll deal with it in five minutes at the end of the presentation. And so now I welcome to the virtual floor, Amy Baer, Prevention Educator for Domestic Violence Services, and Teresa Menting, Executive Director of the Gable Family Foundation Women's Empowerment Series. Good morning, thank you. My name is Teresa Menting. I'm the Executive Director of Gable Family Foundation, which is home of Women's Empowerment Series. And I am here with... Hi, I'm Amy Baer, social worker and prevention educator with Agnesian Healthcare SSM Health Domestic Bound Services. And we are going to talk to you this morning about our organizations, how local women in need have been impacted by the pandemic, and how other local women have stepped up to meet that need. So starting off, Women's Empowerment Series is a year-round program that aims to support women in major, oh, sorry, cannot see my screen there, to support women in crisis, major life transition, or those seeking opportunities for personal growth by developing self-sufficiency and understanding of radical self-love and connections to mentors and community resources. WES aims to ensure a sustainable and secure future for women and their families. At Domestic Violence Services, we recognize that domestic abuse is not only a social and community issue, but also a healthcare issue. <laughs> In addition to the immediate psychological and physical impacts of trauma to individual, community, or family, Domestic violence contributes to a number of chronic health issues as well. We have a unique hospital-based approach to providing services to victims, families, and offenders of abuse by providing behavioral health clinical services in conjunction with addressing patients' physical health care needs related to their present or past trauma. So what does that really mean? What do we do? Well, we're going to focus pre-COVID-19. What did our services look like? Our services were all in person. So we had uh, um, in-person services for victims as well as the offender population. So for our victim services, we really focused on crisis intervention. So providing any kind of legal advocacy or court, uh, restraining orders, housing assistance, or general emotional support. In addition, we had counseling services. And our counseling services were not for only for adults, but for children as well, from ages four all the way up because we noticed that the, we, domestic violence did not just impact those directly involved in the relationship, but those outside the relationship. So our support groups identified that as well. We had support groups for affected family members. We had support groups for victims. And we also had group programming for the offender population who acknowledged that they did make a mistake and they're learning on how to change those behaviors. We also had in-school prevention education. So we went into schools, 4K, all the way up through college, 
and just had conversations and providing education on dynamics of domestic violence, whether it be coping strategies, just educating what a healthy relationship looked like, um, identifying just general emotions and feelings. So we were kind of really immersed within the community, as well as providing general community education on uh, what domestic violence is and uh, that awareness and kind of that, you think of being a being a bystander and getting involved because we want to prevent that violence from happening. During COVID, things changed. Our services did switch from in-person to virtual, but we did keep our in-person services for crisis intervention. So individuals who felt unsafe and we acknowledged that need was more important to have in person. So we did continue that. However, we did unfortunately have to stop our support groups um, we work with individuals and patients who are still in unhealthy relationships, and we felt it was better for them at that time to not have those support groups virtual. We maintained our offender program, but it was just a little bit different. Uh, we kind of went to a homework style, so every week they receive a packet in the mail of uh, um, general education or whatever that topic was for that week but we would have had in person. They just received it by mail. In addition, we unfortunately had to stop our in-school programming. We stopped our in-school programming because the schools were trying to figure out what to do themselves. And we felt at that time it was going to best move it is just to kind of halt it for the remainder of the school year. We did continue our community education. Mm -hmm. It just went virtual. So we collaborated with other agencies on uh, continuing education, whether it be programs like ASTOP or Solution Center or Women's Fund as well. We just had it as virtual, but we still had it going on. Our individual services, uh, such as counseling, we were able to do virtual or over the phone if it was safe. That was the thing that we stressed during COVID-19 is that we let our patients know we were still here. We were a support and backup, but we had also acknowledged maybe it wasn't safe for us to be involved with them at that time. So we really empowered the patients that we worked with and gave them that opportunity and choice if they wanted to continue those services or just pause them until we could reserve, resume in person. And unfortunately, some of our patients did choose to wait. So we were unable to support them during that time. Another thing that we did have to change was our annual Light Up the Night event. We've had going on since the 90s that we were unable to do last year. We did have a display, so we did do something because we know that domestic violence did not stop just because some of our services looked a little bit different and we wanted to show the community and patients that we worked with that we were still here and we were still support in different ways. Teresa, how did you guys look during pre and post COVID? Yeah, thank you, Amy. So for pre COVID, Women's Empowerment Series was actually originally created and developed in the Department of Social Services. So this program started off as an eight week program in the first year. And then we evolved and developed adding a few weeks to make it a 12 week program. We were restricted to services for the specific program. And through the growth, we have found the need to serve women and children in a year round capacity. So as of January 1st, 2020, Women's Empowerment Series started inside of the Gable Family Foundation. And we were able to work on our third year offering our 12 week series and starting in person and year round services for women and children. And now March 12th, which we're coming up on very quickly here of last year, we were all ready to go 150 women, children, volunteers, mentors, uh, meals, everything. They were all divided into five different groups from our women and mentors, uh, women's empowerment series program to our new alumni program with participants from series one and two, a kids crew mentor program for the women's children Teen Life Series, which we partnered with uh, Life Enforcement, and our new Stepping into the Positive program. So everyone was ready to go three hours before. Unfortunately, COVID had different plans and we had to postpone. But with the unknown, if this would be a two week pause or a couple of months, we just knew that many women would be affected and we needed to act quickly. So during COVID, how were local women in need impacted by the pandemic? Well, many of the women we serve are mothers. 
who then had to juggle a whole new world of becoming now a virtual teacher, their work, which several of them were essential workers as caregivers or in the food, food industry or lost their jobs or had to leave their job because of the scarcity of daycare, a lack of access to resources we saw. But during 2020, WS assisted six homeless families in educating on resources, housing and moving crews to relocate and set up new homes for families. We then developed and created an emergency response team and each team met each call from women in need, delivering household items, cleaning supplies, food, as well as education, advocacy and emotional support using an internal network of women and the community who volunteered to step up and assist on the emergency response team. So just during COVID from April until mid-October, we had 210 emergency responses. Yeah. Women's Empowerment Series wanted to support all of our community women in this time of uncertainty. So not just our, our participants, but all women, when it is so easy to come into fear, anxiety, and feeling alone. 90% uh, of our participants, we were reported that during COVID, they were struggling with mental health. 79% domestic violence and 45% with addiction. So how have other local women stepped up to meet that need? And that is really the importance of what our organization does is we really empower other women to empower themselves to step up and volunteer and give back to the community. They're finding their empowerment through volunteering and having a voice and being part of that change and that difference. So local women have stepped up with, like I said, the emergency responses and donation of items. We really stress the importance of relationship building and trust. So meeting our participants where they are on their journey and introducing them and empowering them so that they can take those steps needed to utilize and grow with the support of many community agencies. There might be an agency that they know of, but their mental health and their anxiety inhibits them from being able to take that step on their own. So we are here to walk that journey with them. Local women have also stepped by joining together to create a rotation of women who reached out to our participants on a weekly basis during COVID, or then it transitioned to bi-weekly and then as needed basis. Teams of volunteers and speakers join together to create classes, including our nine week empowerment exchange, which was on Facebook, Cultivating Confidence Through Community. So if you have not seen that, you can go back on our website or our Facebook page. And during COVID, we also wanted to recognize the influx of women empowering other women by supporting local small businesses owned and operated by women. We've really seen people um, spending their money in locally and empowering other people, empowering those businesses and supporting local. Um, we do have virtual classes that we also created and developed, which was a whole new world. And trying to find the technology has really been um, a big thing as well so that we can provide those for the women and their children as well. Um, in-person classes, we started our first in-person class um, in December. It was a grieving class, Enduring Sisterhood, um, support group for women trying to get through the holidays with other women to support them. So what are we doing now? Women's Empowerment Series. Okay, it's, I, it's never getting old, Amy. I mean, even the it's up to you, Amy, but um, you guys are now the third group of people that know this. So our announcement is we are creating a new empowerment exchange, cultivating confidence through community with speakers that are going to be talking about um, our new topic of, okay, this happened, now what? We want to focus more on the coming back, having resiliency and looking towards the future and what happens next. We have a volunteer work program that we developed our, where our participants have the opportunity to volunteer and earn points towards items such as Christmas gifts for their kids, birthday gifts, um, household items, things that they just would love to spoil themselves with. Maybe it's a manicure, um, tickets to uh, games and family activities as well. 
our six week multi community class. We have continuously many classes, virtual and in person, going on weekly. Our resource center and library, which we are hoping to launch really soon. We are still working on some of those resources to be able to finish it off. Um, our childhood trauma awareness community picnic and resource event that will be in August. And our 12 week series that has been waiting like the little engine that could is going to finally come back to light in August of this, this year, uh, whether it needs to transition into a virtual or hybrid um, platform, we'll get there and bridge that gap when the summer comes, but we do have those alternative plans too. And ending our year with our graduation event. Amy, what are you guys doing over at Domestic Violence Services? We're kind of back to normal-ish. Um, mm -hmm. We maintain the mask mandates and we do screenings with individuals all coming in and we just make sure groups are smaller. So we do have a counseling sessions, individual counseling sessions and in-person crisis intervention and consultation. So what I mean by consultations, we do get requests from different departments within the hospital, such as the emergency room or other doctors or providers asking for us to come into that session and offer our services and support for patients. We have um, continued our um, in-group programming um, for our offender population, or we just have it smaller. Um, in addition to that, we have continued virtual, so virtual training programming, and we have started a virtual education series. And that's really collaboration e efforts with ASOP as well as Solution Center, our homeless shelter here in town. ASOP is our sexual assault program. And our virtual training isn't just our program, but we collaborate with other agencies as well, such as Solution Center, ASOP, and then we also uh, collaborate with um, the Women's Fund in their Green Dot efforts. So unfortunately though, our school programming has not continued. And that's just really because we are limited in staff and availability right now. So we just, that's just a, a program aspect that we have been unfortunately able to continue. We are hopeful that we are able to do Light Up the Night um, this year. It's just, we have a few months out yet. So fingers crossed. So as Teresa and I were really putting this presentation together for you guys, we saw a lot of victories that we celebrated as uh, Teresa kind of highlighted because there's agencies uh, like Domestic Violence Services that we were limited on what we could do. And it was awesome to hear that community programs still in our area were able to help pick up those pieces. So it was just a reminder that we do need us all to work together. We do need the collaboration of the various agencies and community members to really meet the needs of individuals who need that support and backup. But we are still missing things. We noticed that there was a um, kind of that early intervention was a need. We are dependent, both of our programs, Teresa and mine, are dependent on referrals. So word of mouth, just kind of a, you know, another telling, hey, this program is here, this can be a support and backup for you. We are limited on prevention education right now and just re really want the opportunity to enhance that awareness. Again, we really see the benefit of working collaboratively and having more individuals kind of working together for that common goal. So what can we do, Teresa? So what we can do, how you can make a difference is there are several different ways that you can volunteer in all different organizations with all different skill levels, time commitments and virtual options. Something that everyone can do to help organ community organizations and to bring awareness is to share, share, share information on Facebook or with those you know. We have wonderful resources here in Fond du Lac and if someone reaches out to an agency and we do not have the tools or what is needed, we refer out and serve. And you never know who needed the information that you're sharing, whether it's for yourself, a friend, a neighbor, or for, for a child. These small steps make a huge difference in our community and our collaborations. The power of prayer. Can I get an amen? Sister Alice? Amen. Thank you. And our virtual programming. There are so many virtual program options, like Amy said, with uh, the collaboration with ASTOP and domestic violence and the Green Dot trainings, women's empowerment, 
uh, Ebony Vision, all of these organizations are working very hard to provide um, information and resources for the community. So please make sure to join those um, virtual program options and conferences just like today. Also, I do know virtual option, uh, volunteer opportunities that um, Amy also has, like we have events and uh, Ignition Domestic Prevention Services also has their light up, and light up the night event. So there's things from the day of to other, other small tasks from helping prep behind the scenes. Okay, quick question for you, Amy. Do you get many participants in your offender program? So our offender program runs year long. Right now, I have limited um, the amount of people. So overall, I have um, for both our women offender program and men offender program, I'm going throughout the year about 20 um, individuals in at a time. And that's spread out through multiple groups to keep our group small. So it looks a little bit different than it had in the past. In the past, we had about 15 in each of those groups. Okay, and Teresa, what percentage of women you serve are women or children of color? Oh, our numbers grow on a day-to-day -day basis of women that we serve. But right now, I believe our last numbers that we had, it was like 38% um, are who we served with of women in co of color. It's also based on who's all uh, filling out our demographic surveys. So it does vary. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was our last numbers that we did have. Well, good morning, everyone. Nice to see everyone today. I'm hoping you're enjoying. You're, we're on our final rotation of our, our sessions this morning. My name is Sister Cindy Ninehouse, and I will be serving as your facilitator for this panel, which is on education, especially during the pandemic. Um, as you know, so if you have questions for the panelists, please type them in the chat, and we will be sure to address them as many as possible during our five-minute Q&A at the end of our session. And some of the questions thus far have just been absolutely terrific. Um, so now I welcome to the virtual floor, Christina Watoon, a December 2020 graduate from Marion University who utilized the Working Families Grant Program. And I also welcome Ms. Carrie Strupp, who is the program's director. So welcome to you both. Let's give it up for them. And I turn it over to Carrie. Welcome, Carrie and Christina. Thank you, Sister Cindy. Good morning. So as Sister Cindy said, I'm Carrie Strupp, and I'm the director of the Working Families Grant Program, or the WFG as we like to call it. It is my pleasure to be here this morning to talk with you a little bit about our program. And since we're limited on time, I'm gonna jump right in so Christina has plenty of time to speak as well. So Marion um, has witnessed the continued need and demand for the Working Families Grant Program due to the issues facing our society, including poverty levels for women, and especially for women who are single parents, as well as a need for access to higher education, which ties right in with our mission of breaking the cycle of poverty through education. Our program is mainly funded by an anonymous donor and the Congregation of the Sisters of St. Agnes, and it's built on a partnership philosophy with an emphasis on support services and advising, academic performance, career preparation, life skills development, personal counseling and mentoring. And our program aligns its vision with Marion University's core values and mission, which engages students in the education of the whole person, embracing justice and compassion, and transforming lives for professional service and leadership in the global community. So the program is targeted towards single, legally separated, widowed, or divorced parents with primary placement of at least one dependent child, age 14 years or younger, and in the household while the student is enrolled in our program. Our participants range anywhere from 18 years of age all the way to people in their 40s. And most of our participants have barriers to overcome when caring for their children while pursuing their dream of attaining a college degree. And these barriers range from financial limitations, lack of emotional support, self-confidence and self-esteem issues, relationship issues, affordable and safe housing, and reliable transfer transportation, just to name a few. So our program assists participants to overcome these barriers by providing the following. We provide a safe, supportive environment through coaching, mentoring, and education, personal counseling and academic advising, financial assistance for tuition, housing, 
child care and food assistance, budget counseling, financial guidance and assistance with discretionary funding for basic needs and hardships. So to even be a little bit more specific with that, um, we provide monthly living, monthly living stipends to assist with rent of up to $555 per month if the participant is the only adult over the age of 18 in the household. We assist with child care of up to $650 per month, and that's for licensed child care providers or licensed child care facilities, and, that, and that's while students are in class. We also provide food cards from local grocers, and that's based on the number of children in each family. So for example, if they have one child, it's $200 a month. If they have two children, it's $250 a month. Three children, they would receive $300 a month. And if they have four more children, it's $350 a month. So in addition, I also uh, mentioned those discretionary funds. Again, those are available for basic needs and hardships. And the way I explain that to our participants is that um, those funds are for needs versus wants. And so this helps to distinguish what we can use those funds for. So all of these benefits allow our students to concentrate on academics. Um, this way, they're not pressured to work full time. So it'd be very hard to be a full time student, a full time parent and a, a full time worker. So as a matter of fact, we only allow our participants to work 20 hours a week because we want them to focus first and foremost on their children, on their family and then on their academics. So participants are expected to maintain full time enrollment. And this helps ensure their timely um, completion to a degree. Um, they're only allowed to be in our program for so many semesters, so we definitely want to make sure they get that degree. Um, there are other requirements to our program, like students needing to maintain at least a 2.5 uh, grade point average each semester, or they need to perform at least 40 hours of community service um, per year, to name a few. Um, and there are more requirements and more details, but I would rather spend the rest of our time with you having the opportunity to, to hear Christina's uh, journey and her experiences in our program. So I'm going to turn it over to Christina. And like Cindy said, she is a recent 2020 uh, graduate with an IT degree, and she has three beautiful daughters. So Christina, take it away. Thank you, Carrie. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to start out talking about my background and how I came to be a participant in the Working Families Grant program. And I started out, I was raised by my dad. My mother dropped out of the picture. She wasn't interested in being a parent. I got my first job when I was 14. I enlisted in the Air National Guard at 17 and I started working in the prison system at 19 and I put in 23 years there before I left to come to Marion. I got married in that time, had three children, and then I got divorced, which financially put a big strain on me because most of the responsibility was left on me. And I was struggling working 60 plus hours a week. So I'm juggling, trying to get home, trying to see my children, plus trying to pay bills and it just got to be so overwhelming and just heartbreaking that I decided I needed to speak to somebody about it. You know, I started talking to a counselor. She listened every time I came and, and knew about my heartache. And, and she thought, you know what, I think you should get out of the prison, go to work in school and get an education, do something that makes you happy. And that got me thinking it really did. And, I had a friend who was going for additional classes at Marion and I spoke with her and she had mentioned that they had a working families grant program. And I had made the first phone call. I didn't get anywhere. The second phone call I did, I spoke with Carrie and she encouraged me to come down and get an application that was outside of her door. And um, that really fired me up and, the more I thought about it while I was waiting for an answer to get in the program, the more I thought, you know what, I'm going to school, whether I get accepted in the program or not, I need to do this. And I got the call from Carrie on the first day of classes. And she asked me if I'd like to participate. And of course I said, yes, I did. And the support came in right away. She said, this is what we're going to do. This is what I want you to do. I took care of all my books. I was ready for class and Carrie and Penny then came into the Working Families Grant Program. And between 
them and Sister Deb and the three ladies really made a difference. You know, you could go in the office anytime and talk to any one of them if you had a had a question or something was troubling you and, and that helped a lot. Once COVID hit, the connection, face-to-face -face connection really kind of put a, a damper on things. We would have activities, we would do luncheons, we'd talk with other people participating participating in the program. We would share tips, whether it be resources, um, sale items. I know um, people had let Carrie know and she would share mass emails about school supplies if people needed something, if it was on sale. I know um, we got to talk with people, people that were uncomfortable or didn't know something about the program, whether they were new or they just transferred in. So we, we all kind of collaborated when we would get together through those meetings and, and Carrie and Penny, they did arrange lots of Zoom meetings and they still tried to share information. If there was online events that would be beneficial to our development during COVID, I, I had my children at home. That was one thing that was different with a lot of people is they did have their children at home for virtual classes and of course, they weren't getting those meals at home, so food bills were going up and other bills were going up and the program was able to give extra food cards and a, a, a gas card here, here or there, um, things to help out with the added costs that were going on at home. So that was beneficial to us when we couldn't get together to do some of these programs and these these enrichment classes. Um, so that was helpful as well. One of the other downsides was being able to get an internship. During COVID, I didn't get any responses to anything. And my degree required me to have a an internship. So between my advisor and the support of the program, we were able to work it out with my employer to be able to tailor that around the needs of the requirement to get credit for the course. So that was fortunate, but that's one thing that made it difficult and, and made you worry a little bit. One of the other things I, I missed was one of the first, especially today where I'd like to be with all of you in person and, and talking around the table is the first meeting I went to, I was surrounded with people that were very powerful women in the community and some of the sisters and I was giving, given some network options where I, I had, um, connected with some women in the Fox Valley and it was the women in technology group. And I'm thankful that I got to reach out to them and get a couple of meetings in before COVID hit. So that was nice that I could do some networking there. Plus the Easter connection we used to do, we went and sat with the sisters at the St. Francis home and we were all encouraged to spread out with our children. And I got to sit at the table with uh, Sister Judith Schmidt and she had let us know all the great things that she's done in her life and how she helped others and how she gave back to the community along with the Sisters of St. Agnes and other people in the community that had helped along with and worked with the sisters. And I had talked about one of our beginning visits, we did go to the the mother house so that when it is safe, I, that's one of the things that I would like to do is take my daughters to see the mother house and get to talk with some more, more of the sisters there because it was a great connection and I enjoyed that very much. So the one thing I do try to keep up with, I do call sister Judith and she'll call me. So we don't have the face to face, but I told her I would send her some pictures of my graduation and and of the girls so that she could see see some faces instead of just hearing a voice. So um, my future plans, I accepted a job and I'll be starting on the 15th and it will be as a loan partner. And I'm hoping that'll open a lot of doors for me and get me some experience in a couple of different fields. So I'm looking forward to that. I got ordained a few months ago. So I'll be officiating some weddings this summer and I checked into the digital cybersecurity program that they have at the UW of Madison. And that was very intriguing and something we definitely can use some help. You know, the cybersecurity issues are 
are not going away. And then I'd also, I uh, spoke with the career counselor at Concordia University to pursue my master's degree in uh, software engineering. So that's on the horizon too for my future plans. I also wanted to share with you how much this program not only benefited me, but it benefited my kids as well. I never realized how much they paid attention until they watched me struggle and they watched me study for tests and they were learning about the value of how, how much hard work needs to be put into to being an adult and to getting an education. The moment came clear that I actually learned something from them was my daughter saying to me, don't worry, mom, God has a plan and, and things are going to work out the way they were supposed to. So this whole journey, good and bad, has been worth it every minute of it. And um, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to talk today. It was very, very uplifting and, and I enjoyed it a lot. So Carrie uh, has a, a thought to leave you with. Thank you so much, Chris, for sharing your story with us. So we were asked to provide you with at least one action item to take away from our short time together. But Chris and I are overachievers, so of course we have more than just one. So. First and foremost, pray for us. Please keep our program in your prayers. Two, spread the news about our program to everyone and especially to single parents with dependent children. Community service opportunities. Contact us and we can share your needs with our participants to give them opportunities to fulfill, to fulfill their community service requirements. This is one of the ways that we really encourage participants to pay it forward. Um, internship opportunities. You know, Chris talked about her struggles with internships. So our students need businesses and agencies willing to offer internships so our students get practical experience and opportunities to gain skills and knowledge in their chosen industries. So if this is something that's interesting to you, please contact us. And finally, donations to our program are very much appreciated. For every dollar we raise, our, non our anonymous donor matches it. Therefore, your donation goes even further in helping to provide resources for our students and for their children. So Marion's Day of Giving is coming up on May 1st. So please consider donating on May 1st to our program. We would greatly appreciate it. So overall, we just wanna thank you so much for being here this morning and to learn, learning a little bit more about our program. We really appreciate your time and support. So thank you so much for having us. Well, thank you, Carrie and Christina and congratulations. Christina on your graduation and congratulations, Carrie, on, on running such a terrific and empowering program. So the, for the remainder of the, our session together, we have some time to chit chat with both of them. So if you have any questions you'd like to just speak out loud or to write in the chat box, that is fine. Or if you have any words of encouragement or anything else you'd like to say to Christina or Carrie. I'm seeing so many, so many friends out there, so many familiar faces, so thank you. Oh, how many students are on our program? It actually varies. So um, typically we have between 30 and 35 students. Um, like this semester, we have 35 students in our program. Carrie, could you talk a little, this is uh, Michelle Majeski from Marion. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the research uh, that is being conducted right now? as it relates sure. to the outcomes of the program. Yeah, so that was a question we had last time as well, like how you know do we keep track of our participants? And so we do, we, um, we actually, when our participants come into our program, we collect uh, benchmark data um, on like their salaries, if they're on any income supports. And then when they graduate, six months after they graduate, we also collect that data. And then even a year out, we collect that data again. And um, this past year, we have been doing a program evaluation of our entire program since 2002. Um, and so we are looking to see, you know, where are people at in their careers? Have their children gone on to university? How have they been impacted? Are they still involved in community service? So all kinds of variables that we're tracking. And then um, so hopefully uh, we're going to be taking that information and then um, hopefully 
sharing that with other foundations to get even further donations, to share our stories, to let other people know what a great program we have at Marion. So um, yeah, so thank you, Michelle, for asking that question. You're welcome. <laughs> and, I, and I just will say like, our program, I know I'm tuning our horn, but I'm very proud of it. But like we have like an 89% graduation rate with our students, which is huge. Um, and so we're very proud of that. Since our um, program has began in 2002, we have over 200 graduates from our program. Um, so we're pretty proud, pretty proud of our students. Other questions? Any other comments? I just want to reiterate what uh, Kira just shared, that this is uh, really uh, just such an outstanding program. Uh, we've had both men and women uh, who've been in the program uh, the impact on their children, on their ability to complete a college degree. Um, that we are so grateful for our anonymous donor and uh, also CSA and uh, all the individuals who donate to this program. It, it, it is a life changer really for many people. Mm -hmm. I just wanna read some of the, the, I like to read the chats, uh, comments that have come in. Um, one wonderful story, thank you for sharing it and congratulations. Um, keep up the amazing work, awesome, thank you. And finally, I can attest to what a difference maker the Working Family Grant Program has been for our students. It really is, it is a life changer for generations, for the student, him or herself and the children, like Christina said, because they're watching. And it's been really exciting to hear about our participants who their children have gone on to the university. Yeah. Um, and some other exciting, you know, statistics, if you will, like we even have one of our professors at Marion, we have a couple of professors at Marion actually that were in the program and now have gone on and gotten their doctorates or are teaching at Marion. Um, you know, and so what a difference that they've made with our students and um, being able to share their experience. And then now they're back at Mary and paying it forward as well. So we, we really do focus on that, paying it forward. And, um, and it's just amazing having the participants come to the programs and they bring their children. And many of our participants take their children to their community service opportunities and things like that. So um, our program really is intended for generational. So by helping our students break the cycle of poverty, it then in turn breaks the cycle of poverty for their children and their children's children. So it's, it's really amazing. Terrific, thank you. Um, I am very honored to um, present to you Catherine Virgos, uh, the president of St. Agnes Hospital, and Dawn Vandenberg, regional um, director of mission integration of SSM Health. And um, these women have truly stepped up to, for the defense of those whose faith, life, and human dignity have been threatened because of their circumstances and cared passionately for the most vulnerable among us. So Catherine and um, Dawn, I turn this over to you. Thank you. Good morning. So I will look to share my screen. Can you see my screen? No, you can't. Okay, let me go back here, share screen. There we go. Now can you see it? There we go. It's yes. coming up. Okay. So we learned from the previous uh, breakout why is this not going from the beginning? Let me go here. All right, we learned from the previous breakout that we need to speed it up a bit so we have some time for questions. So uh, good morning, I am Catherine Burgos. I am the president of St. Agnes Hospital and I am joined here today with Dawn Vandenberg. Dawn, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, I'm Dawn Vandenberg and I'm the regional director for mission integration for SSM Health and I'm based in Fond du Lac uh, where I started as a staff chaplain around 10 years ago already. So it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. 
All right, so as we were preparing for today, um, Dawn was searching through um, some, some of the um, books and resources that she has and found this quote, which when she shared it with me, we thought how strikingly appropriate for the, the last year and um, how this has impacted us as leaders. And so it's from our own sister, Judith Schmidt, our own CSA, act creatively, courageously, and with hope. And I'll tell you that is um, what we've had to do this past year during the COVID-19 pandemic. So there were many different um, opportunities for us to lead through the COVID-19 pandemic. We needed to lead our workforce through a very trying time. Uh, today marks our one year anniversary of COVID-19. We had our first COVID-19 patient come to our emergency room last year on March 11th, 2020. And so ironically, we're here to speak to you today about uh, that experience. So we needed to lead our workforce. We needed to uh, change the way that we worked with our patients and our families and how we commu communicate with them. And we needed to think creatively about how we reach vulnerable populations during this pandemic. And then we'll share with you some reflection that we've done on leadership and what we've learned this year as, as leaders during this pandemic. So our first patient came to our emergency room last year on March 11th, as I mentioned, and there was so much fear and anxiety and uncertainty that was uh, experienced by our staff. We had heard about the COVID-19 virus, uh, but did not ever expect to be one of the first communities in the United States to be impacted by this virus. And so um, it, was, it was scary for our frontline staff to, um, you know, to, to navigate through this uncertain time. And the sadness in the, you know, that was felt because this virus is unlike any other that we've ever experienced as healthcare providers in that, you know, traditional um, therapies were not working for patients. And so therefore our teams were feeling helpless and sad. And, um, you know, when we, when we lose patients or uh, when they weren't responding to certain treatments. So it was a lot of, um, you know, just sadness and uncertainty. And then we needed to look at our workforce and look at what was going on around us. Schools were closing, you know, people were, um, businesses were closing. And so we came together as a leadership team and said, what's the right thing for our employees? Let's figure out who can work from home so that they can be um, full-time teachers and still carry out the work that we need them to do. Can they work flexible schedules? Maybe they don't need to be working during the day. Maybe they can work evenings or nights from home, um, you know, so that they can be present for their children uh, who were home. And then we had to manage really the mental health and the wellness of our own employees in our workforce and help find ways to create an environment of resilience and so, Donna, I'll, I'll let you talk a little bit about the spiritual care team because they were just hugely impactful during this pandemic to, again, not only our patients and families, but our, our employees. Yes, I think, um, you know, as a spiritual care uh, team, both with our bereavement specialists and with our chaplains, um, this pandemic really uh, broadened a new area of ministry, as in the past, it's always been important, of course, to be ministering to our patients and to their families. Um, but really, at, during this time, also another huge area of our workforce, just our frontline caregivers and how deeply impacted they were and still are uh, from the pandemic and be, having to care for people who at first we did see an increase in, in death and in uh, truly sick individuals that came into the hospital. Um, and then of course, the separation between families and patients, um, that took a toll on our caregivers, on our physicians who are faced with a new disease that they didn't quite know how to treat at first. Um, and that caused a lot of angst. And so our caregivers, our chaplains, 
really stepped up and became uh, the chaplain for frontline caregivers. Um, so it was, a, it was a new area for them. So a few other things that we were able to implement was a caring for each other program. And this was a program that was led by Dr. Heather Schmidt and continues today to help teach not only us as leaders, but our frontline teams about, you know, their own well-being and how do you, and then identifying the well-being of the people that you work with and supporting the well-being of one another and our employee assistance fund. So we had, we had employees who were being furloughed and who uh, couldn't, couldn't pay for their, their mortgages and their utility bills and, you know, their own safety was at risk. And so we created an employee um, assistance fund or had an employee assistance fund and really, um, made sure that all leaders within the state of Wisconsin were donating to that so that we could support our employees who were out on furlough. And then the meals and the gift cards and the signs mm -hmm. and the and all of the support from our foundation and uh, the community was just exceptional. And all of those things really help support the mental health, wellness and resilience of our employees. And the increased incidence of workplace violence, you know, from people being isolated and so maybe drug and alcohol use going up, um, domestic violence going up, and um, just, you know, people's mental health literally at risk. And then you, you know, put on top of that, they can't come and see their loved ones who are sick. And so we were, we are experiencing this high number of incidents of workplace violence against our healthcare providers. And so just a few, we've done many things, but a few of the things are, you know, we, re, we increased our security presence um, at the hospital. We trained our teams on real-time de-escalation for patients to really try to keep them safe. You know, Catherine, I think that's so key um, as we think about that is something new that has really emerged in the midst of this pandemic is the um, assaults, if you will, against healthcare workers. And then finding new ways to communicate with our patients and our families. Our patients were isolated, literally isolated. You know, they were in a room, negative pressure. Um, very few people were able to go in and out because of the risk of, you know, infection prevention. And so we needed to make sure that they were still feeling cared for. Touch is so important. And so how were they feeling cared for um, emotionally, physically, spiritually, and finding new ways to communicate with them, our chaplains, um, and nurses orchestrated visits using iPads and their iPhones. And uh, we received a grant, generous grant for iPads so that we could provide them patients with iPads so that they could FaceTime with their family members at home and people could see that, you know, their loved ones were okay. Um, you know, walking through the ICU, I would see our chaplains sitting outside the doors of our COVID-19 patients um, on their, either on their own cell phone FaceTiming with them or with these iPads talking on the telephone for hours with our COVID-19 patients to keep them company and keep them, you know, tend to their, really all of their needs. So it was just, um, you know, an interesting time and in how we needed to pivot in how we support our patients and our families. And then really seeking opportunity to care for those that are most vulnerable. We identified an undocumented, undocumented Hispanic population. You know, they're at high risk. We collaborated with Holy Family and Public Health and Dawn actually attended a mass, the, um, the Father's Day mass at uh, Holy Family to spread the word that it's safe, we're safe. You know, you can come to us if you're sick, if you're, you know, we want to be able to care for you and um, don't be afraid that, you know, because they're undocumented many times, they're afraid to come forward with their healthcare issues. Mm -hmm. uh, at the Roslyn Apartments, which we know housed some of our most vulnerable, we had clinic RNs that were going door to door offering COVID-19 testing. We donated the, used the donated iPads so that they could have video visits with primary care providers. And now we're working on how do we get to our homebound elderly patients to vaccinate them? You know, not easy for them to come in and get vaccinated. So we're working on how we get to them um, and vaccinate them in their home. I think if we think about courageous initiatives and going out to the Roslyn apartments and thinking about our clinic nurses who wanted to bring the COVID testing clinic to the vulnerable populations and went forth and did just that and went door to door. To me, that was just such a, an amazing effort. 
and you'll hear me talk about this on this slide, but that is a true reflection of the ability for people to feel safe in being creative to care for our patients. So looking back this past year, it was, it challenged my leadership. Um, I've grown in so many ways. Um, you know, I, I reflected and found that I really am a big picture thinker. And it's important to, as you know, one of the senior leaders to be able to do that, to be able to look um, kind of high level and see your team and see who, you know, identify your own weaknesses and where strengths amongst your team lie and call on that and lift that up and um, provide a safe place for those strengths to come forward and serve and, um, you know, complement one another. Providing a safe place to deselect work. You know, we needed to focus on the COVID-19 pandemic and as healthcare, as healthcare leaders, we are overwhelmed anyway. And so providing a safe environment for my other leaders to say, what work do you not wanna do right now? You don't have to do it. And you don't have to ask me to not do it. Just don't do it. <laughs> don't do it and, and re, you know, just do what you think you need to do right now to take care of this pandemic and our patients and our, and our employees. And this naturally affirmed a culture where creativity could emerge. That clinic, that clinic, RN going door to door at Roslyn, nobody asked me for permission, nor would I ever want them to. They said, this is the idea. This is what we're gonna do. I said, great, what do you need? <laughs> you know, so just providing a safe place, our ER, you know, they, within a few hours, they had created a completely negative pressure environment, had a whole process in place for EMS to bring people through and didn't ask me to do that. They just did that. And I was so proud and I didn't want them to ask me, but creating an environment where they can just do that. They can just do what they think is right. And, um, you know, for the care of our people. Uh, there were times, you know, where it, it we're overwhelmed and we start to veer and maybe, you know, just redirecting and keeping the guide rails around making sure we always have the patients and their families front and center in the decisions that we make. And so um, I found myself um, gently, gently doing that, you know, when I would see things start to veer and reminding people, you know, how we can maybe do those things, but in a more um, aligned way with our patients and their families. So um, just a few things that, you know, I personally learned as a leader through, through this pandemic. I think from the as well as, is. uh, you know, allowing the spirit to guide. And I think of the conversations, Catherine, that you and I have had along the way during this and just remembering it's so easy to get caught up in what is happening and what we have to do next, but then to take that step back and to reflect and not to be afraid to change course. If something wasn't working and we needed to improvise, we improvised in the moment and really stayed flexible. To allow, to allow the spirit and the creativity to emerge. Yes. Thank you very much, both of you. Um, it's just so um, amazing what you have done during this time and we are so grateful. Um, I would invite our uh, audience here to put any questions you may have in our chat room and I will um, relay them to um, our speakers. Um, while we wait for the questions to come, um, Catherine and Dawn, um, obviously everybody's talking about going back to quote unquote normal. <laughs> um, as you reflect upon going back to quote unquote normal, what do you feel the new normal will be for you as leaders having gone through this? Yeah, you know, I'm a half class or glass half full leader. So I try to find some of the silver linings of this pandemic. And so back to normal may mean that we can be more flexible mm -hmm. with our teams, right? And how we, how they work, how they serve. Um, I think that are there going to be 
times during the year or, um, you know, depending on what's happening with flu and COVID, you know, depending on how this, mm-hmm. right, with the virus that we may need to um, take a few steps forward and then a two steps back, you know, kind of this nimbleness. Um, but I think that those are good challenges for leaders to have to to need to cre- be creative and, and quick thinkers. And, um, you know, so I think those things can also create an environment of teamwork and fun because, you know, we're, we're needing to, we're needing to constantly change and having the security to know, you know what, we've done this. We've done Mm -hmm. this again. Uh, Don't be scared. Don't be, you know, don't be afraid to fail. And, um, you know, so I I think about those things that, you know, I think our environment will completely change. It's changed. It's changed. And whether, you know, we're, we're going forward and things will go back to a new normal. Um, But it's, it's changed and um, that's okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Don, I don't know what you think. But. Yeah, I think we've come out or are coming out of this with a new sense of resiliency. And I think back, as Catherine um, had mentioned uh, prior, is that, you know, our first COVID patient walked in the doors a year ago today. And here we are a year later and have learned so much. And we were also in the middle of a electronic medical record, totally moving from one platform to another. Mm. Um, and that was what we were thinking about. And all of a sudden this hit, and it's like suddenly switching a whole computer system <laughs> became minor, if you can mm-hmm. imagine. <laughs> you know, our priorities changed and shifted. And I think there, that we will never go back the way things were. Yeah. This yeah. really taught us to endure. Yeah. And I think it will be reflecting on in the future, like we don't know what we don't know yet, but we know that we've been changed by this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. A I lot of think, Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead, please. I was going to say, you know, and the, the lasting impact on our healthcare providers is going to mm-hmm. uh, forever. Mm-hmm. You know, this was, this was hard. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so we'll need to find ways to, you know, not only support them now in the moment, but for the years to come. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I have a message from um, Sister Ria. She says, thank you for trusting your people to be creative. Um, that will take you forward. So thank you, Sister Ria. Thanks, um, Ria. Marie Scott, I appreciate your creativity to reach outside the box to think about people that might get overlooked. I'm so proud of what you have done this past year. Makes me cry. Oh, it is a different model of leadership. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Marie. Thank you. Yes, we are very grateful. And I think um, what was so touching, not touching, but shocking to me was the violence that was mm-hmm. experienced by healthcare workers. Um, and, you know, as a, a, as a community, um, how we can be supportive of our healthcare um, providers. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah. we have about a minute remaining. Um, uh, Marie Turner, Maria Turner, I have always had immense respect for those in healthcare, but this pandemic just highlights how amazing everyone is. Just the most beautiful thing to see compassion for others executed in such a massive way. Thank you. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, Carla, as someone who was part of the great spiritual care team for a short time, I am not the least surprised on how you responded and you have been in my prayers. Thanks, Carla. Good to see you on the (laughs) Yeah, yeah. We'll be leaving this room shortly and moving on to the next one. Um, But I just want to thank you both and thank everyone for being present here um, for our for our um, breakout session. Thank Thank you. you. Thank you for the opportunity. Mm -hmm. We will be rotating out now to the next place. (laughs) Welcome back, everyone. I hope you all had a chance to learn something new from your presenters. We uh, we encouraged all of them to share action items to help ensure that you leave today feeling hopeful about how you can have an impact on your community in the days and the weeks and months ahead. Um, So as a way of saying thank you to all of our panelists for presenting their insights, not once, but three times this morning, I invite you to share in the chat something either that you learned 
or something that you plan to do based on your attendance today. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to give give us some awkward silence for you to type those things into chat. <laughs> So for those who may not be seeing the chat, I know some uh, some folks aren't super familiar with Zoom. I'll just share a couple anonymously. So we've got um, sharing the Working Families Grant Program with a young parent that this person knows. Uh, see if I can volunteer at WES, so the Women's Empowerment Series. Uh, somebody in would like to eat more cake. I'm on board with that. Uh, I didn't, I was not in the breakout room, so I'm really enjoying the lack of context for what these things are talking about. Uh, look into more community-based program resources and share those with people in need. Continue to find joy and laugh often and support local businesses. Uh, be more supportive of Light Up the Night. Continue to share the Working Families Grant. Uh, support Shop more at local women-sponsored businesses. Uh, The Women's Fund already reached out to the Working Families Grant regarding her request for potential community service and or internships for the women in their program. And we will look forward to enriching a partnership with them. Uh, So that's fabulous. That's from the director of the the Fond du Lac Area Women's Fund, Maria Turner. Uh, Invite Amy and Teresa to share at an upcoming uh, FAMA meeting, which is, oh man, the Fond du Lac Area Ministerial Association. Took me a second there. Uh, uh, We're grateful to see our faces and to hear the work of others. Shop. A lot of people are going to go shopping. I (laughs) can tell they've all been, (laughs) can tell everybody's been locked up for a year. Uh, Work volunteer with uh, Women's Empowerment Series. Uh, glad there are services for people of color. Find ways to support women, uh, women-owned businesses and minority-owned businesses. Really great opportunities listed in there. If you have others, please feel free to keep them going in the chat. We will um, share them with the presenters after the event uh, is wrapped up so that they can see what, uh, what sort of inspiration they had. Um, So um, one way for those of you who are trying to decide, uh, one way that you can have an immediate impact on your community is by donating to the beneficiary of our annual event, which you all had a chance to hear about today, uh, directly from a recent alumnus, and that's the Working Families Grant Program. It's a proactive program co-sponsored by the Congregation of Sisters of St. Agnes and an anonymous donor, and it provides single parent families with tuition assistance and stipend for food, rent, and child care, uh, which you already know because you heard that this morning. But your generosity is already notable since despite offering this year's breakfast as a free event, you have all graciously donated a total of $1,000 towards the grant program so far just during the registration process. If you would like to make any additional donations to the grant program, you can do so using the link in the chat, uh, which will be there momentarily. Uh, letting folks put their uh, put their things in there. There's the chat for the, the link for donating if you would like to donate anytime. In addition to your donations, we also would like to thank our sponsors for today's event, SSM Health and J.F. Ahern. Their sponsorships also go directly to benefiting the Working Families Grant Program recipients. And then finally, one more thank you goes out to sisters Alice Ann Pfeiffer, Sister Cindy Ninehouse and Sister Sue Seabee for serving as facilitators for our panelists today. And our event committee and tech support team, Chelsea Koenigs, Carrie Strupp, Penny Biney, Mary Christofferson, and Dina Rose. And with that, I will invite Sister Cindy Ninehouse to unmute and provide our closing reflection for the morning. I, before I do that, I do want to thank Dusty um, and Dina and Mary and Chelsea for their tremendous work in putting this together. Um, there is so much behind the scenes work um, before this event and as it's going on with the flipping around in the different rooms and moving people around. So it's tremendous. And it was uh, an event that went off without a glitch. So congratulations to Dusty and your team. Um, Another tremendous event for you. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd like to join in prayer as we bring our women's leadership to breakfast to a close. And I just like that if we, we could just take a breath in and out. 
and just to bring to mind all of the stories that we heard today. And then we pray together. A world is gripped by a lethal pandemic that has exposed more fully the divisions that breed hatred and violence. Shake our souls, O God, and stretch us toward our best human selves, our capacity for empathy and reverence for each and all. Our world cries desperately in need of hope and healing. Challenge us, O God, in the traditions by which we shape our lives so that every person, every need, every hope is honored by our good work and by our love. Our world is mired in prejudice and distrust that has hardened hearts and souls. Burn in us, O oh God, with the bright embers of kindness and move us toward a wide and inclusive love. Our world longs for justice and right relationship. Infuse us, O oh God, with your all-embracing love so we might gather at one banquet table with one heart and with one shared commitment to the common good. And our world needs committed people like our panelists we heard today. Empower us, O oh God, to take action and to respond to people whose faith life or human dignity is threatened in any way and at any time. And we pray all this together, amen. Thank you all for attending today. That is the close of our event. And I appreciate you all for spending your morning with us. Have a wonderful day.